this, friend, is Cadet Sylvester McDribble practicing stalls and spins. McDribble, fortunately, has plenty of altitude. That, at least, is according to Hoyle. But see those clouds down there? Clouds mean nothing to McDribble. And so far as any trainers, transports, mountain peaks, or what have you, that might be under the clouds, those are furthest from Max Scott. Dear, dear. Fascinating, isn't it? But look what's under the clouds, all unaware of what's spinning above them. through clouds is a dangerous business, as those who have tried it and lived will tell you. But for the ungobbled word on stall and spin recovery, suppose we listen in on flight instructor Taylor and his student Pete. Like all pilots who yearn to live out their full three score years and ten, Taylor believes in making sure no other plane is in the way before attempting stalls, spins, or acrobatics. The simplest way to do this is to take a good look at the practice area ahead while climbing out into it. Gentle F-turns make it possible to see the entire area. Then, when you reach the area and have enough altitude, you make whatever additional turns unnecessary to be absolutely sure no one is behind or below you. Then, as you're doing your maneuvers, keep an eye out for other planes so you don't have to spend too much time clearing yourself between maneuvers. Let take off, and you gradually let the nose get too high. If you're in reasonably well-balanced flight, you'll get lots of warning. The nose looks too high. The engine begins to labor. You have to keep pulling further and further back on the stick to hold the nose up there. And if you're not tensed up on the controls, you will feel them getting mushy. The plane shudders. You can see the wiring quiver. The plane may mush a little before it stalls. You may get that sinking feeling. And when it does stall, you'll get a sudden mush or jerk, which we call the brake. Then you start to spin. Feel that brake, you react instantly, pushing the nose away from you and easing on full throttle, you can still avoid a spin. But notice that I recover from the stall before recovering from the turn. That is, I push the nose straight away from me and then pick up the wing. Watch. That was a slow speed stall. The turn, we will not let the nose get too high. And we'll make the turn steeper than a climbing turn should be. As we steepen the turn, you can feel some increase in apparent weight. Also, you'll notice that we're exerting quite a lot of back pressure on the stick. And the plane may vibrate if we approach the stalling angle slowly enough. Now, watch for the brake. We push the nose away from us, apply full throttle, and then pick up the wing. Now I want you to take over and make a level turn to the right. You have it. Now steepen up your turn and deliberately skid it by adding too much inside rudder. Make the turn steeper and steeper until the plane stalls. And when it stalls, notice that it will spin to the inside of the turn, that is, in the direction of too much rudder. another turn to the right, but flip it. That is, deliberately use too much outside runner. Again, make the turn steeper and steeper. And notice that when the plane stalls, it will start to spin to the outside, to the left, in the direction of excess running. We call this spinning over the top. In any stall, except when you're inverted, 
get the habit of instinctively pushing the nose straight away from you and smoothly adding full throttle. In stalls close to the ground, the natural tendency is to want to pull the nose up. Pilots who have recovered successfully from stalls close to the ground will tell you that the hardest thing they ever did was to get the nose down with the ground close below them. Speaking of stalls out of turns, ever hear of the Hiya Mabel stall? Maybe you've got a girl who lives somewhere out on the edge of town. One day when you're out solo, you decide to disregard the flight rules and go over and buzz Mabel. Lord, you know you'll be washed out if you're caught, but you're feeling pretty cocky, so you fly over and start to circle the house, hoping Mabel will come out and see you. But your circle's a little too big, and you're afraid you'll miss her, or she'll miss you, so you keep deepening up your turn. Pretty soon, sure enough, Mabel comes out and waves at you. But that lower wing gets in the way, so you can't see her. So you apply top rudder to get the wing out of the way. So you pay a call on Mabel, right in her own front yard. Pilots sometimes spin in while flying pylons for the same reason. They concentrate on the pylons to the exclusion of everything else. They lose all consciousness of what the plane is doing. They let their bank get too steep, or they skid or slip without realizing it, and they stall. When we get to steep turns, you'll learn that in entering a gliding turn, the steeper the turn, the more you lower the nose. Why? Well, in a straight glide, like this, your nose is low enough to counteract the drag you have at this angle of attack. You want to keep that same gliding speed in your turn. But drag is so much greater in a steep turn that you have to lower the nose to maintain your speed. However, if you keep on seeking the turn, you will soon reach a point where, even at gliding speed, you will exceed the stalling angle. Just how steep you can make a gliding turn without stalling is something only practice and experience can teach. Practice at high altitudes in which you train yourself to recognize by the sight, sound, and feel of the airplane just how close you are to the stall. Planes do not stall themselves. They are stalled by the pilot. And except in the inverted attitude, they stall because the pilot pulls the nose toward himself, either too fast or too much. The exact timing of the two actions, pushing the nose away from you and picking up the wing to relieve the stall, is something you can learn only through practice. Essentially, you'll know by the feel of the plane when the stall has been sufficiently relieved. I've already given you some idea of how valuable rudder control can be when you're stalling the plane for a landing. As we approach this stall, Notice that even after the ailerons are completely ineffective, we can still control the wings with the rudder. We're close to the stall now, and the ailerons have almost no effect. But after the plane is completely stalled and starts to fall off on a wing, full opposite rudder will pick up the down wing. As the plane starts to fall off the other way, we apply rudder on the other side. Again, the low wing comes up. We're in a stalled condition and losing altitude fast, but we're keeping the plane from spinning by continually picking up the low wing with rudder. This maneuver is called the falling leap. Later on in the course, you'll learn to do it. But in the meantime, it demonstrates a very practical procedure which may save you from ground loop. Sometimes, as you come in for a landing, the wing will drop. You've got to get that wing up or ground loop. Apply quick rudder and the low wing will come up nicely, allowing you to make a normal landing. That procedure is important to know now, but it'll be a lot more important when you get into heavier aircraft later on. So get used to picking up the low wing with rudder when you're close to the stall condition. Don't attempt to use aileron. That will only aggravate the condition. No matter how familiar you are with stall recovery, there's always a chance that you'll get into a spin. So the technique for spin recovery should be just as instinctive and automatic as stall recovery. Now I'm going to do a spin to the left. You see, felt tight? Okay. We start with a wing level stall. 
As the plane slows down, we ease the nose up to the three-point attitude. And just before it stalls, we apply full rudder in the direction we want to spin. In the spin, you're stalled, but you're also rotating. You must stop rotation by using full opposite rudder and relieve the stall by getting the nose away from you with a positive forward motion of the stick. The instant rotation stops, neutralize your rudder. Then, as you feel the airplane regain its lift, ease out of the dive. To recover from an accidental spin, you first have to know which way you're rotating. And remember this. The only thing that matters is the way the plane is turning in relation to you. If your nose is turning around to the right, apply full hard left rudder and push the nose away from you. If the nose is turning around to your left, apply full hard right rudder and push the nose away from you. The instant rotation stops, neutralize your rudder. Then as you feel the airplane regain its lift, ease out of the dive. Your pull out from the dive following the spin must be properly timed. If you pull out too soon or too abruptly, you will stall again. A stall such as this following a spin is called a progressive stall. It's a stall progressing out of a spin recovery. Another common mistake in spin recovery is failure to neutralize the rudders at the instant rotation stops. This puts you into a skid or slip. Watch. Now, if you combine these two errors, that is, if you pull out too sharply and don't neutralize the rudder soon enough, you're stalled in unbalanced flight, so you're sure to whip off into another spin. And this time, the plane will spin faster and wrap up tighter. The second spin is called a progressive spin because one spin progresses out of the other. But the opposite extreme of pulling out of the diet too soon is waiting too long to pull out. When you do this, you lose a lot of altitude and build up excess speed. So your pullout has to be more gradual and you lose still more altitude. You want to get out of your dive as quickly as possible without stalling again. Just how quick that is, only the feel of the airplane can tell you. And you learn to judge this by plenty of stall and spin practice at high altitude. You may get the idea that the yellow peril doesn't spin easily. And if you show reasonable judgment, it doesn't. You can stall it in balanced flight, and oftentimes you'll merely experience a dropping of the nose. Because the Yellow Peril was designed for the stability and safety primary students need in an aeroplane. But soon you'll be flying advanced trainers, and later your service or combat type aircraft. And in both of these, some of the stability has of necessity been sacrificed for speed, long range, and the other characteristics which make each particular type of plane more effective in doing the job for which it was designed. Those aircraft often spin more easily than the primary trainer. There's often less warning of an approaching stall. So the more you learn about stall warning, stall and spin recovery in the primary trainer, the better you'll be able to cope with stall and, if necessary, spin. In the more advanced type planes, you'll be flying a little later on.